And if I take the trip sufficiently slowly adiabatically, then the wave function will accumulate a phase which is e to the i phi. And if I take a trip which does not surround the flux, then uh, the wave function will come back to itself, will not gain the flux. So there are three desiderata. The first is a. You see, in the Arona Bohm effect, I get an overall phase on the wave function. This is usually less interesting than relative phases. So I'd like to get a situation where I can get something more than just an overall phase. The second thing that I would like to generalize this 
is the, I want to consider a situation where I could replace the, the overall phase by a unitary rather than a phase. So I want to, uh, to generalize the setting to a non-abelian setting. But I want to retain this beautiful feature of this Aronov-Bohm effect that the uh, unitary I get would be topological, that it would depend on the nature of the path, but not on its details. So if I make a small deformation of the path, I will still get the same unitary. And uh, there will be the magic thing, which will be the an analog of the flux. It will not be in the flux. You'll see it will be something else. Uh, that uh, provided I surround it or don't surround it, I get, uh, I get different answers. So this is where I'm headed. So far, you're still with me. Some of some of At least one. So uh, now let, let me tell you what I mean by Pauli Hamiltonian. So I, I think you all do, you all know, but uh, let me mention nevertheless. So I consider a charged particle in magnetic field, but the particle also has a magnetic moment or spin. So a Schrodinger equation is now an equation for a, a two-component vector. A, the piece on the left describes the, the I grad minus A describes the spatial part of the wave function, and the one on the right describes what how it acts on the spin. So, uh, so the Schrodinger equation has two terms. One is uh, what you would call, uh, say, Landau Hamiltonian or Landau magnetism, and the piece on the right would describe the direct interaction. B dot sigma would describe uh, a Pauli term. Pauli Now, uh, and sigma are the usual Pauli matrices, sigma x, sigma y is I sigma z. So this Schrodinger equation is a two by two matrix, which is operator valued. Now, uh, there is a magic that occurs for this equation when G equals one or two, I don't know. There is a nice value for G. <laughs> uh, Actually, I think the way I wrote it up here, it's for g equal 2. That in, in the case g equal 2, it's a perfect square. And it's a perfect square. It, you could write it as minus i grad minus a dotted with sigma. So uh, this is, these are two vectors. You dot them and you square them. And if g equal 2, you get the equation upstairs. Now, in real life, g is not precisely 2. It is 2 plus a small correction, which could scale like fine structures con constant square. So it's 2 plus epsilon. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that it is 2. So I'm cheating. OK, so this is the Pauli Hamiltonian, and I'm going to investigate this, uh, just this, this, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian. Now, because it's a perfect square, it is clear that the spectrum of the Pauli Hamiltonian is always positive. It is just kinetic not negative because it's a square. Now, I think the case you are very familiar with, uh, which, which is the case of a constant magnetic field, then the Pauli Hamiltonian, in, let's consider the case of two dimension. In two dimension will be just a sequence of Landau levels. Each one of them would be infinitely degenerate. And the upspin and the downspin would occupy the same level except for the ground state. I'm with you? You're with me? But I'm not going to be interested in this case. And uh, the, the case that Aronov and Kasha were interested in was the case where the total flux of the magnetic field in the plane was finite. Now, so I'm interested in the case where the magnetic field vanishes near infinity. So there is a total flux which is something, and then near infinity it is zero. Now, because the uh, magnetic field vanishes at infinity, uh, I can always take my particle and put it near infinity, and then it's essentially free particle. It hmm? doesn't see any magnetic field. Therefore, there will be a continuous spectrum uh, at positive energy. And the thing that Aronov and Kasha focused on, and I'm going to focus on too, is at the zero mode. I'm going, I'm going to, interest, to be interested in the question, what happens at zero energy? Okay. So, 
So this is the, the geometric setting. I have a plane. In the plane, I have, think of some uh, finite magnetic field that has total flux phi. And I denote the flux by this number. And uh, I'm interested in zero modes. Now, zero modes are a solution of the square of something operating on psi being zero. And if the square of something operating on psi is zero, then it's also true that the first power on psi would be zero. So you reduced uh, the problem from studying a second order PDE, partial differential equation, to, uh, to first order PDE. And uh, Arolov and Castro made an observation about this equation and the following, and this is the observation they made. Uh, okay, you can write this first order equation that I wrote in the previous page. Uh, it was a first order equation with a, uh, we need to write, hmm, where do you want to explain this to me? Uh, let, let, me, let, let me jump here. So the first order equation I wrote for you was just the first order partial differential equation, but matrix value. Now you can convince yourself that you can have a solution either a spin pointing up <coughs> or spin pointing down, and then you get a simple equation for the spin pointing up solution, which say would be this one. So now psi is just an ordinary function. It's not vector valued anymore. Hmm? And z is uh, x plus i y, the complex coordinate in the plane. And uh, uh, this is an equation that you can solve explicitly. And the solution is given by this, here uh, in the second line up there, the solution is given by the fact it's exponential of the Laplacian minus one acting on the magnetic field. And this gives you a wave function. So, uh, so you find, can find the ground state explicitly. This is what uh, one of the found out. Now, since the Laplacian in two dimensions behaves like a log, the wave function, the zero modes decay like a polynomial. They don't decay exponentially. This rhymes with the fact that there is no gap in the space. So you have zero modes which decay polynomial. Now, a, an interesting observation is like this that if psi is a solution to this equation upstairs, since there is only dz bar in this equation, then you can hit it with any power of z, and it will still be a solution. So if you, I give you one zero mode, you can get as many zero modes as you want by just multiplying by z to the j. However, if you want the solutions to be normalizable, then you cannot take j to be too large. How large can it be, take j to be? It can be as large so that it will still not uh, hit, or it will still be able to be controlled by the polynomial decay of the solution I did before, which was determined by the total flux. And the consequence of this, this is the of kasher theorem. The of kasher theorem is the, sta is the statement that the number of zero mode is essentially the total flux minus one. In fact, it's the ceiling of the total flux minus one. So this is the Aronov Kasher theorem. Hmm? Did I, at least did I make clear the statement? Perhaps not the proof, but yes. So this is two zero because there are the zero. The what? Zero because there is a continuum. So there is a continuum. Space. Yes, above it. Above it. But there is a well-defined subspace of zero modes. And this, the dimension of the subspace is determined by the total flux. Regardless of speed of the interaction constant or? Well, there is uh, just this only Hamiltonian. The, there is, uh, that's, that's what the magic number two is. Hmm? For G, G, with G. There is spin orbit, but with G. <laughs> There is uh, Zeman plus Pauli. Hmm? Okay. 
Uh, so this is this is the statement by, made by uh, by Aaron of Kasher, and now I want to and now I want to build on this build on this observation. Uh, who is my chairman? How am I doing with time? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Is well an integer or a fractional? Fifteen more minutes. What? Fifteen more minutes. Fifteen more minutes. That's good. Fifteen minutes. So the game I'm going to play, the game, I, even if you didn't understand anything I said until now, and if you still are interested to hear the rest, then uh, all you have to know is the following thing. That I have a well, if I describe to you a setting where there is a finite dimensional subspace of zero modes for particle in a magnetic field. And uh, that's it in two dimensions. Now I'm, now I'm going to make a variation on the theme of uh, this Aronovka and Kasher. Note that the dimension of the space of zero modes is determined solely by the total flux. So suppose the total flux was uh, Three. Then, uh, according to our own of Kasher statement, the space of zero mode is two-dimensional, and it will be two-dimensional no matter how I partition my magnetic field in the space. So I'm going to partition it into blobs. In fact, I'm going to partition it into many blobs, and I'll use the, the basic idea I'm going to play with is the following simple idea that I can move. And I will think of this magnetic field as being attached to flux tubes, which I can control and which are classical. And now I want to ask the following question. I'm, I manipulate these magnetic fluxes by moving them, but not changing the flux. So as long as I move the flu fluxes in the plane and I don't change the fluxes, this dimension, the space of the zero mode is stays fixed. Nothing bad happens. <coughs> it, is, it may be moving inside the big Hilbert space, but it moves it continuously in a nice fashion. And the basic question I'm going to ask, this will be the light motive of what I ask is, suppose I take fluxes and I start braiding them. Okay? In particular, consider, uh, consider orbits where I made the, the system at the beginning and at the end was the same I returned, I returned all the fluxes to their same original positions. Then the space of zero modes made some motion in Hilbert space, but at the end of the day, it, it was the same space of zero mode as it was initially. But because of this motion that I did, there could be, it could generate some interesting unitary in this space. And this unitary will be the analog of the one of bone phase in the one-dimensional case, but now it can be a unitary of any dimension, or a, the dimension fixed by how many, what's the dimension of the space of zero modes. <laughs> Just tell them it, I'm busy no. now. <laughs> but? It's mine? <laughs> Okay. Uh, now it's a, a interesting. It's interesting, and I'm going to focus on this case because it's particularly simple and nice. It's this nice to think about the situation where each flux tube carries a <coughs> flux which is less than one. You remember, if it is more than one, it can bind an electron. But I'm going to consider the case where it's too weak. I'm going to consider the case of weak individuals. Now, if it is a weak, uh, if it is a, a, if phi n and phi b, the fluxes at position a and position b, b <coughs> are less than one, then the solution in, in this, in, uh, that I wrote for you, you can write it explicitly, just one over z minus xi a, where xi is the position of flux a, and one over z minus xi b, the solution, uh, this is the, for example, this is a solution to the equation I wrote before. And it's a bona fide, finite, good solution. It is true that it diverges when, xi, when z equals xi b, but the divergence is only weak 
it is still, the wave function is still square in type of wave. But it's not uh, in the value. Yes, it is, and it shouldn't be. Because the way to think about this solution, you know, I did, when I said that the, I gave you, this is an interesting and amusing point. When I tell you that I give you fluxes, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, I did not completely specify the problem because I didn't tell you yet what gauge I fixed. There is a freedom of choosing gauge. So th this solution corresponds to a special gauge that I want to uh, think about. And the gauge that I want you to think about is a gauge, Think you see the red lines there? Put a delta function for the vector potential A on this A, a and this is where the A field lives. It only lives as a delta function of this thing. And therefore, <coughs> you expect to have the wave function to, uh, the wave function should have branch cuts, and these branch cuts are associated with these red lines, which, which you, I didn't mention it, I shouldn't say. Okay, so this is the solution. Now, the thing I want you to pay attention to is that the solution I wrote here, the phi's are too, so small that they, this is a local integrable, square integrable function. But if I have two of them, and if phi a plus phi b is still large enough, the wave function is decaying fast enough to at infinity, so I get the bona fide solution. So this is how point flux ones look like. And the, the question I'm going to, interest, to be interested is in the following thing. So uh, I'm going to be interested in, as, as I described, taking these uh, fluxons and starting uh, flux tubes and start braiding them. And I want to ask what kind of unitary do I ge generate? So the way to think of this is like this. Uh, Should it be at the above? I want to do everything, you know me, I do everything yeah, very, yeah. very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Here there is a continuous. So there is a thorny issue of who fixes the adiabatic time scale. It's a good question and I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> okay, I, I will say something about this, but I will not give a fully satisfactory answer. So the, the, the game I'm going to play is like this. Here are these fluxon solutions. I think I said it, but I'll say it again. I'm going to be interested, like, uh, in the case of weak individuals, but a strong community. So what do I mean by this? That each individual fluxon is, much, is less than one, but I have many fluxons, and the total number of fluxes is large, say 5, 20, 100, or something. So this is the case I'm going to be interested in. So the solution is written here. There is this overall envelope function, which is made from these functions I showed you in the previous slide, slide or generalization thereof. And I can hit it with any polynomial in Z, provided that the degree of this polynomial is not too large. Hmm? Now, so. If, if you think of P0, P1, etc., th this will form a basis in the zero mode subspace. Shall I say this again? No. So basically what I'm interested in is in the following question. Uh, there are these zeta, which are my controls. These are the things I move. And the response of the system is represented in this, in this these numbers, complex numbers, P, P0, P1, and P2. P. And I'm going to ask the question when I take Xi a cause in a trip, what kind of motion do I generate in the space of zero mode, which is expressed in the motion of these P's? Yes. So another thing you could do, I guess, is, is you could divide up the fluxes differently keep among the weak individuals, right? And keep the sum the same. Yes. And but that they would have different. Uh, you want me during the motion to change the value of. No, not during the motion, but I'm saying it, 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 it just in terms of, I think in terms of the, the low, the, you know, the zero energy subspace. Mm -hmm. You could just describe it like this, but you could also get zero energy states by dividing them. That's by, true. Yeah. I could. But that, would, that, but that, would, that would just correspond to a different. 
the it, it, magnetic field in it. So it's not so uh, for a given for a given set of fluctuations. So yes, I'm going this to play. This is a complete description of, of the of the zero mode. I'm going to play the game where I do not repartition the fluxes among the two. I, I just move their positions. This will be all the control I will allow myself. But you can also study it. Now, now by general, so here is an example. Uh, so here is an example of uh, that I have, uh, say, three weak individuals, identical, but the total flux is uh, three fifth. So uh, the uh, and you can now ask questions like this. Suppose I fix uh, xi one one of the fluxon at the origin, the other fluxon at one, and the third fluxon I, I just allow myself to move arbitrarily. Now, so the first question is, can you generate a non-trivial unit? And the answer is yes. In fact, you can generate a, a non-trivial unitary. I can compute what is the berry phase accumulated by uh, zeta 3 if it makes a small, just a little orbit around itself. And uh, you see the picture of the Berry's curvature here. So what does this picture say? This picture says that you, you get some, un, uh, some interesting unitary. Uh, this is the case, by the way, where the space of zero mode is one dimensional. So all you can gain is just a phase. So I can represent it by a number. And the, cur the Berry's curvature is just a real number. <laughs> and, uh, then, then you see that the this looks, looks like two volcanoes, right? So uh, you get Berry's curvature, which begin to diverge as you approach the fluxes. Hmm? So when you get too close to the fluxes, you start getting very large curvatures. But other than this, you get uh, some nice finite curvatures. So this first shows that the model is rich enough to generate interesting unitaries. But this is a bad example. Because now the, the unitary I generated did not depend only on topology. It was sensitive to everything. I just made a little wiggle in the position of the thing. It's not like Bomarono. I don't circle something. Just any little path created a different unitary. So I'm in a world where everything is sensitive to everything. Good. Okay, how am I with time? That's what happens when I weaken the video. <laughs> what? That's what happens when you have weak individuals, very sensitive. <laughs> well, you see that if weak individuals form the right com uh, strong community, this doesn't happen. But we will, have, we will need the condition. Uh, now, in five minutes, so I, I'm, you know that the when you take things, when you take uh, frosted food out of the refrigerator, they tell you, you, they tell you you should be careful with the frosting. So uh, there is an issue here which I, I could warn you about how to do the frosting right. But I don't know if I really... Well, let's do it like that. I will not explain this, but if someone wants me, I'll say some, something about this first thing. I'll invite a, a question if you want to ask me. So now let me, let me turn, so now you have to crank a little bit of machinery, define what do I mean by parallel transport, but uh, let me jump to uh, I think a reasonable rule that you can accept as a starting point. So I take my solutions, which were psi zero. You remember this product of uh, z minus psi to crazy powers. So there was some explicit function which I wrote. And then I take as a basis z to the k, which, which spans, spans, spans the space of polynomials. And I look at all my, uh, it, at this matrix, which I call GJK, which is z to z bar to the j, z to the k, sandwiched between these two points. And this, I want to think of it as a metric in control space. Control space is the position of the fluxes, and the metric is determined by the Hilbert space metric. 
So now I defined a metric in control space, but which is some, somehow only associated with the space of zero modes. So it tells me some information about the geometry of zero modes. Now, uh, if you look at this metric, then uh, you can now st use standard formulas for computing, uh, for example, curvatures and parallel transport in the metric. And uh, for example, the notion of uh, the analog of gauge field would be g to the minus one partial g with respect to this control parameter which, which are the position of the forces. What is g? What is g? g. Here is g. Oh, the metric. Right, this, this metric. Okay, now. So uh, what can I say about this g? So it's a matrix. The dimension of the matrix is the size of the degenerate of the space of zero modes. Hmm? Uh, so let me call, it's a D by D matrix, where D is the number of zero modes. So this is, it's a D by D matrix. N is the number of controls, is the number of flux tubes I have. So again, N is the number of flux tube, and D is the number of zero modes. Now it turns out by a miracle that I don't understand how they thought of it, but he explained this to me. It turns out that there is a beautiful factorization fact, that this G factorizes into Psi, G, Psi, Well, this part is only a function of Zeta, and this part is only a function of Zeta bar. And the G in the middle is uh, not a function of either zeta or zeta bar. Now this, you would say, who cares? But it's a good... Uh, uh, the, the point is like this, that the, in, if you use this factorization fact and you look at the equation, this is the equation for parallel transport, this is the standard equation, p plus a times p is uh, parallel transport. If you use the fact that I told you about the factorization of g with respect to the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part, you can pull out psi star and g out of this equation to the left. And then you are left with a very simple equation, d of psi p equals zero. Now, here is a miracle. If my weak individuals live in a strong community which has the following property, if, if the degeneracy equals to the number of flux tubes I have minus one. So if D equals N minus one, then the matrix on the left is a square matrix. And if a it's a, actually a positive square matrix. So if a positive square matrix hitting something is zero, then the something is zero. Now what does it mean that the something is zero? It means that D of Psi P is a function. Right? It's locally well defined. So in this case, P itself becomes a function. So this means that there will be no issue of local sensitivity. There will be no local curvature. The local curvature will be zero. So you say, OK, but now you are in danger that the unitary will be zero. Well, it will not, because this psi as, as uh, a D, who is fast asleep, pointed out. <laughs> the functions I had at my disposal were, brand, were living on uh, branch Riemann surfaces. So P is going to be a function with, with, a, with branch cuts. So let, let perhaps the picture would be like this. It will, so the, the psi, these psi's that uh, appeared in the previous equation is a function like this, but it didn't think these phi's are not integers. These are branch, branched functions. And therefore, they have an interesting Riemann structure, which is drawn here by the cut. And now, if you take one of the flux tube around another flux tube, you cross the cuts. And as a consequence, you net generate a monotony. And this is the monotony you generate. Now, so I arrived at a situation where I succeeded in generating setting where by moving fluxes 
and braiding them, I create non-abelian transformations in the space of zero mode, which are depend only on topology. So what property, I'm sorry? And so what are new A and new B? Uh, did I say? Wow, I did not. So nu A is e to the i phi A. So it's the complex number associated with the flux in the flux tube A. So uh, uh, when you look at this monodromy matrix, for example, if you look at its eigenvalues, its eigenvalues are one and the product of the, of the two nodes. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I basically told you everything that I wanted to tell you. Uh, I'll tell you about, there are several disappointing things. Uh, there are so, several disappointments. For example, uh, I don't want to put fluxes carrying one unit of quantum flux. Why? Because then the monotony I get, nu A times nu B would be the identity and the monotony would be trivial. So uh, the most obvious candidate uh, where nu is, uh, where the flux is one, doesn't do anything interesting in this thing. Now, uh, I think uh, another case which is interesting is nu equal a half. Right? In superconductors, I think I can get nu equal a half. So hey, I, I, I can get five. five. I can get one half of uh, our own bomb flux in superconductors, I think. Nu is minus one. Then the nu is minus one, and that's again a bad example because the product <laughs> of two minus one is still one. So the two simple cases, one, and uh, where well, the flux is one and the flux is a half, do not give an interesting uh, and, and yon, um, do not give interesting unitaries, but any, anything between them does. So anything other than these two would be fine. And uh, so I think, so what did I tell you? I told you that point like fractions are behave like non abelian anions. And when, uh, when the flux, uh, this, this equation, yeah, I think this equation is wrong. Anyway, the, when there is a relation between the flux and the number of braiding onions, uh, when the total flux equals n minus one, when the total flux equals n minus one, then the braiding of fluxes is topological. And that's our flux. Of this monotony. So, okay, instead there's a beautiful mathematical concept, but what, what does it mean for observables? Yes. I think this should, you should ask uh, how to do this. But in principle, what I told you, I told the procedure which would generate a unitary. So, uh, this would act like a gate. Uh, for example, if I had a if you want to look, use the language of, of uh, you know, quantum gates, then I, you feed me uh, qubits at the entrance, I'll tell you how to make gates whose nature is basically topological. And then at the end of the day, you ask me, what should I measure? Hmm? Now, in, in, for example, if you do gate business, then at the end of the day, you just want to measure spin up or spin down. So um, I mean, you give this condition. So the what? You, you give a condition, you know, between D and N to, to for this to be topological. And yes. uh, is that the only? I mean, is it a ne uh, necessary condition? Uh, I mean, so this is a sufficient condition it's for it to be. It's sufficient. But, the, but you don't, don't know if it's. Uh, I necessary. don't know if it is necessary, but I think it is. Uh, we don't have a sufficiently clear understanding to say when else such thing happens. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But uh, I give you an account uh, with this counterexample, for example, where it is violated when, when yeah. uh, it's not topological. Okay. Th this was this graph with these two volcanoes. Mm -hmm. Yes, then. Can you, can you put the whole thing on a, a torus or something? Uh, the you that maybe it's total, total flux of an integer or something and that to, to, so that you'll have a, an actual gap to the zone Well, I think, uh, I, I think it's a, this is a wonderful question. 
I think we, uh, much of the progress we could do here was because of this factorization formula that uh, that I told you that G factorized into holomorphic, anti-holomorphic pieces. And we don't know how to do it in the talks. At least Odette doesn't know. And he doesn't know. <laughs> So this factorization is, uh, I think in principle you could ask the same questions on the torus, but it, I do not know the answer to the question, is there some choice of fluxes and number of fluxons where the, uh, where the monotony would be topological? I, I don't know the answer to this question. Okay. The fact that it doesn't work for mu to one to one half, does that mean that it will not work for quantum? Uh, probably, except if you one was clever enough to make quantum flux into the other fractions. Right? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, something, I don't know. People yeah. know. the obligatory uh, ASA history thing. Actually, uh, Astro Casa came down very early in his career to business in San Diego. And uh, they hung out at this beach place, which he tried to go to later, and they didn't like it so much. Uh, uh, one thing that happened there, they, they worked with me on an on, on AKLT model, but a connection to Laughlin State. So that gives me an excuse to talk about Laughlin States. This is probably the closest asset got to working on Lockland states, after magnetism. And it actually had a big impact on his career, I believe, since uh, this is where he started using Schwinger bosons, which they've gone on to uh, come up in the okay. okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you about a uh, some slightly different perspective on fractional quantum core and composite Fermi states which emphasizes uh, quantum geometry as the key principle and the, flux the geometry of flux attachments. And we can understand both uh, the, the, the fractional quantum pool states and the composite Fermi liquid states uh, in more microscopic detail by this. So the basic point is that I would say that uh, the Lofton state keeps kind of giving back again as a place we, we look in and find inspiration for some new ideas. And uh, all sorts of new ideas have come from looking at the Lofton state. And what I want to talk about, oops, what happened here, uh, is uh, geometry. So the usual picture of flux, the older picture of flux attachment is probably like the one that Daniel Rovers had in his thesis where some kind of lightning bolt of flux got shoved down the throat of the poor electron. But flux attachment has a shape, a geometric property, which I believe is actually the key principle for why fractional quantum Hall states exist. Okay, and actually the quantum Hall state from the quantum geometric viewpoint, these uh, projected states in a, in a lambda level, they're actually very remarkable systems from the point of view of condensed matter physics. They're ultraviolet complete without having any kind of atomic lattice structure needed to make them regular. So the regularization comes completely from uh, the quantum geometry of, of, of the non-commuting guiding centers. And in some sense, that's very similar to the ideas about the Planck length of people in, in gravity. So there's the, this is ultraviolet complete because fuzziness, quantum fuzziness gives you a regularization at short distances. So of course, this is the uh, the fractional Hall effect and the Lofton state is the principal, uh, the original uh, source of inspiration and in understanding of this. And now there's there's the Lofton state here, but also we are going to talk about the composite Fermi liquid states, which are this is going to be a condensation of composite bosons, and these are Fermi liquids that are composite fermions. But the basic thing about the Lofton state was it it came out of the blue in some sense. I believe Bob, Bob was actually did a three-body calculation for quite different reasons to try and understand what happened when the, the, the what happened to the short distance singularity of the Coulomb interaction and how it makes lambda levels. Um, but then as, as a consequence of, of daring to do a numerical calculation, he found some nice low energy levels and it was small enough that he could work out what the wave function was, and this is where this all began. 
So the Luftwaffe gave a, a, an extremely complete picture of, of what was going on. Uh, this is a model, and it's, it was quickly confirmed that it worked. And, uh, but I would say it's never really been explained right. Well, there's a lot of kind of pseudo explanations where you come up with a, uh, a nice sounding explanation, but I believe that the basic principle still needs to be uh, clarified, and I think it's this kind of geometry principle. But you don't think pseudo potentials can be pseudo explanation? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. So the, the one, one point to make about this is that the only source of the only source of, uh, of, of any absolute believable inf real information is problems come from numerical validization because these systems have no connection whatsoever to which theorem and states that you can do Feynman diagram methods on. So the microscopic picture requires no, uh, still a number. Uh, if it does have a way to do it on a with pencil and paper, uh, it doesn't have to be discovered yet. But so. Uh, what you see in these pictures are what you get for numerical diagonalization, and the basic point is, this is for a clean state, that there's a fundamental gap in these systems, which is nothing to do, not particularly a gap for charge excitations, the fundamental gap in this system is a gap for excitations that carry momentum or electric dipole moment. And in a uniform magnetic field, electric dipole moment and uh, momentum are proportional to each other. So these states here have no electric dipole moment, and to create a state with dipole moment, you've got to have an excite above a gap. And these incompressible fluids are, they don't support any kind of sound wave. They're not like Euler's fluids, which have an infinite speed of sound. They don't transmit pressures through their bulk, and that's when the key is. The dipole moment and inversion symmetry turn out to be the fundamental uh, things to focus on in, in, in the fractional airplay, and also in the context. So let me mention the Occam's razor principle, that if you reduce a model to the simplest form that exists, that, that, that uh, contains the physics that you want to explain, you should not, it's, a, it's an incorrect idea to put anything else back in that model and, and view that as part of a fundamental explanation. And that's of course why people look at the Hubbard model, because there's a hopeful belief or belief or hope that it'll turn out to, you can get high, maybe or maybe not get D-wave high TC out of uh, Square lattice Hubbard model, but whether or, but if, if you can, then then you won't need anything else in the Hubbard model to explain the uh, wave superconductivity as a fundamental principle. And if it's not in the Hubbard model, you have to find what else you have to put back in to get it. Well, here you get everything you need in the quantum geometrical model. It's got a bit cut off here. So this is actually uh, so the model is only is completely determined by the non-commutative geometry of the guiding center. So all you have is a Hamiltonian, which is an interaction. And there's no kinetic energy of any kind in this model. So anything that involves Galilei invariance or cone theorem that stuff is outside the picture should not be included in a, in a fundamental discussion of fra why the fractional quantum quality exists. So we have basically, a, uh, the basic thing is a two-body interaction, which fundamentally is inversion symmetric just because the particles are identical. And on top of that is a perturbation in the, you're going away from the speed limit, uh, 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 a term which is uh, inhomogeneous. And the dynamics completely comes from the, 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 the quantum geometry of the quantum plane, and you can get the electric current, which is really just the derivative of the polarization operator, totally in this, uh, in this um, projective lambda level problem. So this is the essence of the problem, and anything else has got no business in the, in the model. I mean, of course, it'll, if you want to be more realistic with the real system, then you can find the effects of other things as perturbations. But if you want to understand why that whole effect or the composite Fermi liquid exists, you can only, they're both exhibited by this model. So where, did, so where did it come from? This is, of course, the, the classical coordinate of the electron, which is commutative, can be split in the presence of a uniform magnetic field. Decompose, can be decomposed into the sum of a guiding center plus a lambda orbit, which individually have non commutative geometry, and the, uh, the one body physics of lambda orbits uh, quenches or, or removes from the problem the, the guiding center degree of freedom, they are left only with the non commutative uh, of the geometry parts. Okay. And the, actually, this is a, a key 
thing which will come back in the composite fermion problem. So the fact that I, I gave the geometry in terms of the, the, the Lie algebra like permutation relations like Rx, the x and y components regarding center of the von Neumann told us that for Heisenberg algebras the, the most the, the more a more important thing was to have the right behavior of the unitary operators, U of Q, which are the things that cause particles to jump, the translation operators. And if I take a product of these guys with a uh, sum of the q's adding up to zero, so it gives you a little going around a closed path in momentum space, then the, uh, the product of these things, of course, reduces the identity times a phase factor, which is precisely the, the area of the uh, polygon in momentum space times the suitable magnetic units, which are the magnetic units. <coughs> magnetic <coughs> area. Okay, and in fact, this function Mathematically, at least, these, these, for these functions of, of non-commuting variables to be well defined, they actually have to be ultra-smooth functions. In fact, they have to be entire functions in the complex extension from two real dimension to two complex dimension, which is so they can so you can expand them about any point and get an absolutely convergent expansion where you replace the non-commuting objects by their by their symmetrized products. And luckily, of course. This thing came from projection into a lambda level, and automatically the form factors of lambda levels, which are Gaussian and four, are precisely, precisely uh, strongly falling off enough to make these functions, the entire functions. Let me skip forward. So, putting aside the impurities, the, the substrate potential, the entire clean limit problem is just this Hamiltonian, which is a function of a two-body interaction of non-commuting variables with the dynamics completely given by the quantum plane. And it's known that this has three types, at least three types of ground states. And these are have, these have been verified by numerical, by the only method which we have for discovering what the ground states are looking at, exact organization of finite systems. So you either get the uh, incompressible gap inversion symmetric and topologically ordered fractional whole states which have a, a, a if you're depending on the boundary conditions have a topological multiplet of inversion symmetric states with a gap to any states that carry uh, a non-inversion symmetric quantum number oops uh, I think that's the wrong one uh, They, they can, of course, have rather trivial states, which are um, translation, spatially, spatially uh, broken translational symmetry. So this has, the symmetries of this baseline model have both inversion and translation symmetry. The, of course, there's lots of big, lots of phases where the, which are actually dominated by the long range parts of this potential, where you have uh, a broken translational symmetry, basically the lambda level gets filled up in some regions and empty in the other regions, and you get various stripe or bobbin phases. And the third kind of, but the third kind of interesting state one gets out of this is essentially the one which uh, the Halpern Lee Reef state is the, is, the, is the key idea of. And this is the, uh, the composite Fermi liquid state, which is a state which is compressible, it's gapless, but also has, a, but has unbroken translational symmetry. And if we call the, the identify the fractional quantum Hall states as states exhibiting a fractional a quantized Hall effect, the gapless composite Fermi liquid states they do not exhibit a fractional quantum Hall effect because they're, they're gapless. Uh, but we know the kind of uh, broke, time reversal broken symmetry states with broken time reversal symmetry, which in this case is due to the magnetic field. Uh, Fermi liquids with where, where you don't have any Bohm-Majorana phase, where you move in straight lines, uh, are anomalous Hall metals. So the Fermi liquid, composite Fermi liquids exhibit not a fractional Hall effect, but a anomalous Hall effect on the Fermi surface. So again, this is a, one point about this thing is that a lot of work in this problem has focused on the notion of wave functions. Lofkin told us what you can state was the lowest lambda level wave function. This is actually completely incorrect. Of course, he found it that way by thinking of it that way, but it's not the correct way to think about the Lofkin state whatsoever, because in a quantum geometry, you don't have a Schrodinger representation. So these states, whatever they are, they're not, uh, they're not uh, 
not wave functions. And in fact, they're not particularly land lowest lambda level states either. In fact, the, the basic distinction, that we call it in the, the equivalence of the Schrodinger and the Heisenberg, Heisenberg pictures of quantum mechanics is absolutely based on the existence of an orthonormal or an orthogonal local basis. And once you don't have uh, a set of a local basis set which is orthogonal, then you've lost Schrodinger but Heisenberg is still with us. So the Heisenberg is a more fundamental uh, formulation of quantum mechanics and Schrodinger is a special case when you have the usual case where you have uh, orthonormal uh, local basis which is not present in, because of the quantum fuzziness in this problem. Okay. So basically you can ask kind of riddle questions when is a wave function or a wave function? It's a kind of geometry. So Laughlin state is not a wave function, it's a state. Uh, so, of course, a lot of very great calculations have been done, so it's not that the calculations are wrong, it's possibly the interpretation of the calculation. The people doing the calculations were not really clear what they were doing. And actually, uh, I'm not going to talk about it here, but this actually, this little insight recently led us to uh, a fantastic, uh, some new formulas which allow you to do quantum Monte Carlo in a much, much better way for these kind of problems. So it's not just a kind of, it's a, the idea that they're wave functions are not just it's not just a kind of uh, ideological point is actually a practical point. There is some, there's some important identities which are missed if you think of these things as, as showing the wave functions. Okay. So the basic thing you see in the Laughlin state is the flux attachment, which is uh, this point here. The fact that every electron is surrounded uh, keeps an empty space around it. So one important, one key, one kind of surprising feature of Laughlin's wave function when it emerged, it was proposed as kind of initially as a kind of trial wave function with no adjustable parameter. And for a long time, no one noticed that it has an adjustable parameter. It's deeply hidden by the, uh, the, the holomorphic structure. In fact, this thing has a geometry, uh, a, a parameter that you can vary and we'll see it in a minute, which is a geometry which is a shape of the flux attachment around each particle. The other point is that the, the, the essential problem makes no notion. This, this uh, guiding center quantum geometry problem doesn't say which lambda level you're in. So again, we should have known all, all along that the Laughlin state was not a lowest lambda level state because it was experimenting experimentally also found in the second lambda level. And more recently, it's been found on lattice, on lattice systems, which exhibit uh, um, fractional churn insulators, which have got nothing to do with lowest lambda level structures. Okay. So we need to reinterpret it. And the hidden geometry is as follows. If I, if I start with the original formulation of the guiding centers and the lambda orbits, you see there are actually two independent Heisenberg algebras in the problem. One for the, what I call R and the other called R R, which is the lambda orbit and the, and the lambda and the, and the driving center of the orbit. And uh, the, uh, one of these is that this is the Heisenberg algebra of the orbits. Um, but if we actually convert the, we actually realize that we should be writing the Laughlin state as a Heisenberg state, not as a Schrodinger wave function. So if we actually convert it to the correct form, it's actually, in, we're going to write it completely in terms of the the operators involved with the, the guiding centers, we end up with this Heisenberg form. And everything that referred to a particular lambda level is gone from the problem. Uh, but there was still, doing this case, we still actually have a, a, a memory which is gone of, of the shape of the lambda orbit, which is p squared in the, the original case is just p squared over 2m. So the, the, the p squared over 2m, this really defines a complex structure, and that's what gave rise to the complex structure, in this case, Z plus P plus IPY, that's like X plus IY, it's a complex structure. But no one said that 2X plus a half IY was not a good complex structure to use. So the original formulation inherits an unnecessary specialization to choose a complex structure which is compatible with the shape of the lambda orbit, and impose that on the shape of the guiding center, freeze freedom. So what we actually need to do is the A daggers, the guiding center operators, should not, 
we should we, we have no reason having got rid of the lambda orbit structure to call to use x plus i y we should actually just use a more general form and in, more generally these operators a and a dagger are the eigenstates or the raising and lowering operators of a, of a quadratic form defined by a metric and that metric is the hidden parameter of the Lofian state uh, so it's actually not one state, it's a family of states continuously parameterized by, by a unimodular metric. And so I put uh, this G in the in the, of the, 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 the the vacuum state it acts on is the one annihilated by the A's, but they depend on the choice of G. And uh, so we're left with the question of what, how should we choose what <coughs> state is a relational state? How should we choose G? And if the G should be chosen to minimize the correlation energy choose the shape of the correlation hole surrounding each electron to minimize the energy. And uh, uh, of course, if I impose from the beginning a rotational symmetry around the normal to the 2D surface, which is kind of implicit in p squared over 2m as a, as a kinetic energy, I wouldn't have, I'd have, I wouldn't have realized I'd automatically use group theory to find the, find the best uh, metric. So by just using this over this unnecessary symmetry of the problem, I'd have hidden from the fact that there was a choice to be made. Okay. And in fact... So G lies in A or it lies in zero? Sorry? The metric lies in the state zero or it lies in A? Both, because the zero is defined by the state. It's a, Heisenberg, it's a fundamental representation of the Heisenberg model. So the zero is defined by this state, which is annihilated by A. So both A and A dagger depend on the metric and also the vacuum. Are you assuming a uh, metric constant in space? Or Sorry? Is the metric constant or varying in space? In the more general case, in the Lofty wave function, it's constant. Okay. It's a flat metric, and we'll come to quickly uh, if I can get to this. Uh, find it. So, in fact, so the choice of the metric, uh, the Lofty state depends on the choice of the metric. Only, only one actual state doesn't depend on the choice of the metric. The field down the level, m equals 1. That state is a, has no correlation hole in it. It's a state of determinant. And in fact, these are all fundamentally unnormalized states. They're product-based states, right? It's this, uh, these holomorphic representations of Heisenberg algebra. Uh, so in fact, the only thing in this state for m equals 1 that would change if I change the, uh, uh, at least if I do it with periodic boundary conditions, would, if, as I change the metric, would be the normalization constant. If I do it in the disk geometry, the shape of the droplet will change, but not the shape of the correlation hole, because it isn't one in the new confined case. But the Lofgren states are a family of states parameterized by geometry, unlike the film number. Okay. So let's just get, so the key idea for understanding all these problems is, is flux attachment and its geometry. So we had a talk uh, uh, about uh, helium-3 or helium-4 recently. And in fact, one can make a strong case that there's a, there's a conceptual similarity between these incompressible quantum fluids and quantum solids. They both have a, a fundamental unit, which in the quantum solid is a unit cell, and, and this unit, and this has a shape degree of freedom of this fundamental unit, which is the shape of the unit cell in the solid, and fluctuations of the shape in the solid give you the acoustic uh, phonon degrees. So a solid could be viewed as, a quantum solid could be viewed as a bounce, as a condensation of a particle with its own vacancy. So if I remove a particle from a solid, I leave a vacancy behind, the solid is stable provided that potential is, is uh, deep enough to confine the, the particle when I put it back in its own vacancy. And of course the Lindemann criterion for when applied for quantum melting of helium is when the zero point motion of the particle is, is too big to be contained inside its uh, own vacancy. And this actually is a, uh, this is actually a very similar to what happens in flux attachment picture in the uh, quantum Hall case. In the quantum Hall case, uh, what you see in an often state exactly is that every particle, in this case an electron, uh, it could be a group of particles in the more general case, uh, basically reserve to themselves a, a little vacancy or a vortex a certain, with a certain vorticity in this solid, in this liquid, and, oops, and all the other particles are excluded from that. And in the Lofgren wave function, there's a 100% exclusion of the other particles from the 
the region that's owned by a particular particle. And uh, again, this, this is a, a physical process, the attachment of the flux, and the, the thing that drives it is that the potential of the correlation energy you gain from attaching the flux uh, is big enough, and the, and the potential that you get from making this kind of vacancy in the fluid is deep enough to bind the, uh, the particle. And that will actually depend on the, on the shape of this potential B, which is affected by form factors, so it's a, it's a deeper potential in the lowest lambda level of the projection. In higher lambda levels, the only aspect of which lambda level you're in is a form factor, which, which, smears, which smears out the potential and makes it less deep in the stronger one. So the fractional Hall effect, flux attachment will occur when there's sufficiently deep potential to bind, to, to, uh, uh, to bind a particle inside it. Okay, this is a, so the kind of, I uh, won't go through this because I don't have the time. But basically, uh, there's the various features of flux attachment. And the key thing is that the fractional Hall effect, the objects that are formed by flux attachment are bosons. And so they can condense. That's all. A few other points of interest in the thing is that the, the, uh, the, the shape of this correlation hole has, has a quantum zero point fluctuations around the, one, around the shape that minimizes the correlation energy. And those zero point fluctuations turn out to be the famous uh, uh, long wavelength behavior of the structure factor, which, which Gerber and Bohm and Plasman found in the fraction of the It was necessary for that. And there's also a spin associated with it. So in that sense, the fraction of Hall effect can be understood very much like Mott-Hubbard physics. In the Mott-Hubbard effect, uh, incompressibility, there's a pre-existing set of lattice sites which don't, and a particle can occupy that, and, and there's an energy gap for adding extra particles to those lattice sites. So in the fractional Hall effect, the underlying orbitals that don't want to be multiply occupied, are not, their shape is not predetermined, but the area is predetermined by the, by the conditions of the fractional Okay, so let's just move on to the, the composite formula. So apart from the shape, the other degree of freedom of these composite objects is their dipole moment. So the, the flux attachment is actually inversion symmetric about the center of flux attachment. Uh, so once flux attachment occurs, you actually, the, 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 the guiding centers have an essential ambiguity, origin ambiguity in the general case, there's an ambiguous origin of these things. So once flux attachment occurs, every particle gets a natural origin which to be displaced relative to, like in a solid. And so the, the, the guiding center degree of freedom had a gauge, in, had a, a gauge change, could change its origin. Now its origin has been fixed. It's, it it's becomes a much more physical object than di the dipole moment. The displacement relative to the center flux attachment is a dipole moment of the composite object. So there are actually two independent degrees of freedom, just like in a solid. The acoustic degrees of freedom are the, uh, the shape of the unit cell and the, the, um, the polarization of the unit cell, the, the optical degrees of phonon modes are the internal displacements which give rise to dipole and moments of magnetization inside the unit cell. So the same, the similar thing here, there's a shape and a dipole moment. And actually now we find out through this uh, fundamental relation between dipole moment and, and uh, momentum that this mysterious where was the origin of the quote mass, effective mass in all these kind of composite languages is immediately explained. Because the energy as a function of momentum is also the energy as a function of dipole moment. So essentially, for small distortions, the effective mass tensor is just the electric, the, the electric polarization tensor. And in general, the, the dispersion relation of these particles will turn out to be just the energy as a function of dipole moment. So the key idea in both of the in, in these phases, both the uh, composite Fermi liquid phase and the fractional Hall phase, is that at the correct particle density, of course, the, the Berry phase, due to the, the, uh, as the vortex or the uh, flux, attached flux, moves with the particle, the, it pushes the other particles out of the way, and you generate a Berry phase, the usual vortex Berry phase. And of course, at the correct drilling factor, this exactly cancels the Bohm-Maharola phase, so these composite objects can move in straight lines, even though there's a magnetic field. So Lorentz force is cancelled by the magnetic force. So if these objects are bosons, 
they can condense in the zero momentum state, which is the inversion symmetric state of the composite object. And this is when you get this, uh, and the flux attachment is a gauge condensation, which so makes the, which in a similar way to a superconductor, when the vector potential in some, in some, in some loose way becomes an observable, in this case, the, the, the gauge ambiguity of the guiding centers is gone because they, 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 they have a center of attachment when the condensation happens. Uh, so, oops. so the bosons, so in this case, the bosons condense in the, in the, in the inversion symmetric state, and that's when you have, have this gap between the incompressible ground states, which are inversion symmetric, and any, any other states which carry a non-inversion symmetric quantum number. In the Fermi case, you, you have to form a, a, an anti-symmetric state, so that you have to form a Fermi C in momentum space, which is really dike number space. Okay, so there's some rules which tell you whether the Fermi is a boson. So again, this is a kind of picture of a third loft state, which is a bosonic state. You can go and talk about the hierarchy states this way too, the J states, where two particles condense at five. But let's move on to, and the spin is the coupling to Gaussian curvature of the metric. So let's move on to the, uh, the, the opposite Fermi fluid. So about 10 years ago, we found that you could integrate the formulas, the, the formulas, the, the Luttinger provided a formula which was, was only in the late 1990s discovered to be the same as the, 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 the TKN, the, 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 the Coslet, the Palace, uh, the Coslet, the Komodo, and the Nightingale formula, the TKN. Coslet, it's nothing. Palace, yeah. Komodo, Nightingale, TKNN. Right. Yeah. Okay. But it turned out. Luttinger's formula was kind of buried because it was written in a more obscure formulation, and for many years people have written Luttinger off as nonsense because, in fact, Luttinger was written off as nonsense because people didn't understand the difference between the B field and the H field, and they thought Luttinger violated the <laughs> um, But anyway, so the, this gave you a formula for the intrinsic or the uh, dissipation as part of the, of the whole conductivity. The whole, the whole conductivity. It, by summing over all the occupied states for the Fermi energy. And it was clear that anything to do with uh, conduction processes should be completely describable at the Fermi level. And of course, in the fractional Hall states, even though there's a gap in the bulk, or the integer Hall states for that matter, they're gapless states at the Fermi level at the edge of the system. Uh, so if I'm going to integrate these formulas in the two-dimensional version of this tells you that the intrinsic a normal Hall effect is uh, modulo an integer, which is the kind of part associated with edge states. The, the, the bulk part coming from the Fermi surface is just essentially given by the phase shift for moving a quasi-particle around the Fermi surface. And uh, this was actually what Sohn invoked in, in, in his uh, Dirac picture, which we'll come to. Okay, so we get a so the anomalous Hall effect. The very you could measure it. Uh, the intrinsic anomalous Hall effect can be related to taking a, a very phase factor for, for kind of moving, which is essentially a lot of a sequence of small, a small momentum scattering events to take a particle around the Fermi surface. And at least this is provable to in diagrammatic perturbation theory for kind of regular electrodes, but it seems to be a universal result because we can see also find it in these composite Fermi liquids that have no obvious Perturbation theory of okay. So, well, these are we get to the new, the new, the new developments. I mean, HLR, Bert and Co. They had this remarkable. They noticed this obvious, but in retrospect, but remarkable idea that flux attachment could also lead to uh, composite fermions that had a Fermi surface, uh, and. They also presented a toy model of uh, non-relativistic particles <laughs> with the Chern-Simons field glued by hand, kind of effective uh, field theory. So I'm going to distinguish the two basic ideas: the flux attachment idea, which you can, which you can find a microscopic uh, uh, projected Landau level image of, and the kind of toy model thing, which is uh, an effective theory, which I don't believe contains uh, necessarily geometric space. 
So, more recently, we've got this. Uh, Son has pointed Dan, Dan Son has pointed out that uh, the HLR model didn't properly give you the particle hole symmetry, and he came up with a, a, another toy model version, which was to glue churn Simon's fields to Dirac, to, I mean, Dirac particles. And this has actually been very enthusiastically endorsed by very many people at the moment. And uh, but I would say. It's, a sim it, it's in the same spirit as HLR, it's an effective toy model theory where you've taken a, a, a field theory of regular particles and glued a churn Simon's field to it. And that will always miss the, the non-commutable nature of it. So I, I believe if you, can, if you want to do field theories, you've probably have to be doing non-commutable field theory pictures for this. So this is the point, the Dirac, the so-called Dirac theory is actually a Z2 theory. So, so we, want to, we know that we should get a phase factor of pi or a phase factor of minus one for taking a quasi particle around the Fermi surface that we knew it was half. Uh, by assuming that the, the previous formula is a general formula. Which is <coughs> but the model of Sony is to model it on graphene where the, the phase factor of minus one you get is not a geometric phase factor, it's a <coughs> phase factor. You have a Z2 singularity associated with uh, Dirac cone. And so this has nothing to do with geometric variable phases. This is a topological phase. It's independent of the geometry of the path, only of the topology of how many times it winds around the notional singularity. And I believe there's no, no basis for such a singularity, although, and I, although may, if there is, I'm going to find it in a, in a calculation which is underway. <coughs> but I would say that the, this is the clear distinction. The so-called Dirac composite Fermi picture uh, posits a Z2 topological phase factor for going around a notional, some kind of uh, uh, topological singularity. So, uh, so this is built in because the new equals the, the, the minus one factor when you uh, sigma x y equals a half is if you project in a lambda level, that's the case for particle hole symmetry. If the completely projected case sigma x y is actually exactly given by by e squared of h times mu, with no corrections. Rho x y is corrected by sigma x x, but sigma x y is always just given by the filling factor in this projected case. So the paper of Sohn actually had a formula in it which had excited a number of, uh, of experimentalists because it purported, it, it set up uh, Burt's theory as a kind of straw man. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I believe as Burt does that you can probably fool around with the uh, HLR theory <laughs> to make it come out both right, but this has been set up as a kind of straw man that I calculate rho x y minus sigma h to the minus one over sigma x x squared. It came out of some kind of complicated calculations involving RPA and this, that, and the other in Sun's paper. Uh, and it's supposed to be equal to zero for HLR and it's supposed to be equal to minus sigma h where sigma h is a half e squared over h. So this is exactly what gets experimentally excited. They can distinguish between two, between two theories. They can say this one's right and that one's wrong. Uh, and sadly, I actually got some paper, oops, I got a preprint or a draft or something from one of the experiments. I guess I shouldn't name him because he hasn't released it yet. Uh, and in fact, they were defining, they were identifying the particle symmetric point by looking on their data where sigma, a, where sigma xy was equal to sigma h. And they found out that this formula was, was remarkably accurately given by this and completely not given by that. So therefore, HLR was completely wrong and Dirac fermions were confirmed. But actually, <laughs> when you look at this more closely, you find that this is a tautology because the, this, form, this, this curious combination here is actually when sigma xy is equal to a half, this is identically equal to minus one over rho xy, which to very high accuracy is equal to up in sigma h, if rho x x is typically was two kilo ohms in the experiment and rho x y was 56 kilo ohms, this number was actually 1.002 or something like that, which was very, so it was a very good fit to one. <laughs> so the question of whether of how to verify these theories is still uh, is still open, right? So I have a different interpretation, which may or may not be right. We'll find out, but. Uh, Going back to the space factor you get for scanning around a, uh, a closed loop in K space and imposing the, the secondary feature that that closed loop is the Fermi surface which has a lot of material in it, I'll finish now. Uh, 
uh, you immediately get the expected answer from the, the formula for the normal Hall effect that the phase factor for scattering the quasi particle around the Fermi surface is equal to 2 pi u, which is minus 1 for u equals a half, and uh, e, to, e, e to the pi by 2 for u equals. So basically, you get a, a, a completely, this is a geometric thing now, the test between the two things, if I took the particle around a, a path which was slightly different from the Fermi surface, phase factor would change geometrically, while in the, the, the so-called Dirac theory, the phase factor would stay exactly equal to minus one. So the question whether, um, okay, this is kind of, a, let's move to the end. Um, so when you look microscopically, there's some nice model wave functions one have, and they all have this character which has nothing singular at the, at the center of the Fermi surface. Well, uh, uh, so we have two pictures, a uniform, but case-based Berry curvature, this one that comes out of the quantum geometry, and a kind of non-relativistic light dispersion, which is just that the, 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 the energy as a function of dipole moment is non-singular around the inversion symmetric point, which is the center of the Fermi surface and the Dirac picture. So I can actually try to compute this, which I'm in the middle of doing, so maybe I'll have to eat my words. <laughs> but I found out exactly what we could do to do a real calculation involving exact diagonalization and looking at the um, the exact eigenstates of new equals a half systems, which, which are known to be <coughs> exact diagonalization confirms that they're part of the whole symmetric. Uh, and uh, the missing ingredient, I think, in the, or possibly missing ingredient in the Dirac theory, etc., is that these are not exactly the same as, 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 as graphene. There's a twofold topological degeneracy associated with each of these states, and I think that's probably a close so Anyway, so this is. So there are two, dis two very distinct uh, interpretations of why you should get a phase factor of pi, which you have for the uh, new equals a half case. And the other case, geometric, gives you a phase factor of pi by two for new equals a quarter, etc. And uh, so this is, I guess, a, I think I'll use up my time. <laughs> I'll just show you probably that there's actually a very good, one can actually write model wave functions which, which uh, have this kind of thing. You choose a, you have a, the periodic boundary conditions when they pose, they, they select, you have to put your di put your particles in with a certain kind of pattern of dipole moments. So, and uh, so you naturally get a cluster a thing which is like a Fermi C. And the model wave functions, well, there's no obvious reason for them to be particle symmetric, at least for small numbers, and we're trying to do it for bigger ones, actually. Uh, 99.99% particle symmetric. <coughs> and my postdoc claims that that, that, that 99, the fact that it's only two decimal places or something, or four decimal places, is significant. And, but, I think, but it's a slightly ill-conditioned Ill kind of matrix inversion is taking place in, in this calculation. So until we've done it better, I, I'm not, I'm, so there could either, these model wave functions which have no obvious business with particle symmetric are incredibly part of the whole symmetric. And either they need a little tweak to make them fully particle symmetric, or they actually are in the numerics of a transfer. It's a non trivial thing to turn a model wave function uh, given in this uh, polymorphic formulation into the, 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 the formulation used for exact diagonalization. So solve that sometime soon. Okay, I guess. Uh, I'm actually going to consult with Asset about how to calculate, do some Kubo model calculations. I realized from Asset's talk or whatever that there's some Kubo model calculations to see if we can actually see how to calculate sigma Lx by exact ionization for systems with a, uh, by putting on a, a non-uniform background potential. It looks like it's a well-paced system. No, but there are additional uh, 
uh, differences from the Dirac model and actually the physical model? Well, I would say that they change the phase as well. Uh, I'd say that the, the, essence, the essential physical model is this projected one, it contains the physics. Right? So I'm not going to talk about and the mixing effects and this, and stick to the, in this, in this model. And this is a model that exhibits quantum pole symmetry. Once you, so the zone agrees with me. The uh, center was kind, of, was kind of trying to say you could define Dirac to be what you wanted, but uh, which I pointed out was something like calling an arbitrary handbag a butchy handbag. You can't just give some, call something Dirac. Dirac certainly has its meaning, at least in graphene, that there's some kind of cone structure or singular structure that you get a phase factor of minus one when you go around the ten reverses there and Dirac. The story is that the, the particle whole symmetry of the physical electrons turns into a time reversal invariance of the composite Fermi. But this system actually knows it's sigma x y equals a half, not plus or minus a half. The, the Z2 thing is completely agnostic about which way you go around mm. the contour, right? And the underlying algebra is a chiral. You see there's a Heisenberg algebra with its chiral. It's a right-handed Heisenberg algebra. So I see no, I mean, I'll have to read, if it turns out that the particle symmetry does, uh, I guess I, I show some matrix elements which I haven't yet calculated. Yeah. I'll have to eat my words. <laughs> but if I, it'll be interesting because then in if I do have to eat my words, I would make some progress in finding out where this uh, analog, where the, where the Z2 singularity is coming from, if there is such a thing. But uh, I, I, I don't believe I'll have to eat my words, but I can't be sure about it until I've done the calculation. But I'm not smart enough to, do the, to see this. I'm not, I don't trust myself enough to, do a, to, to rigorously prove this just by the the basic difficulty is the, the extra topological degeneracy problem with the thing which is not present <coughs> in the free firm analogs that are being used as effective field theories, I think fundamentally changes things. Great, there are no further questions. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you all for coming.